the Loop. This is a podcast by Texas Run Loop. Um, the UP University of Texas Hyperloop team. I'm Gavin Nader. I am the head of business and I'm a senior studying economics. I'm your other co-host, David Spittler. I'm the head of engineering for Texas Guadalupe, and I'm currently pursuing my master's in mechanical engineering at UT. So today we have a really fun episode. It's one of our first. Um, one of our advisors is joining us, Michael McDaniel. Michael is an award-winning designer, team builder, and a top-level problem solver. And just for the flex, he is followed by Barack Obama on Twitter. How you doing, Michael? <laughs> Good, guys. How are y'all? Doing well. Doing great. Got past the snow day, and now we're cruising. Yeah, yeah, seriously. Didn't um, really affect me though in the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, sure. Everyone's looking for fun, anyways. Um, to yeah. start, um, can we just go back to how we met and kind of how you got involved with us and why you're sitting in Hyperloop? Oh, sure. Um, I've always been interested in any kind of transportation, um, especially ways to get people around faster, better, and cheaper. So. Um, I've always followed Hyperloop and was looking for an excuse for it, but um, I actually met the team um, doing a talk uh, on uh, commercial kind of off-world construction uh, for commercial applications. Um, and it was probably about two months before I joined Icon even. Uh, so I met some of the guys, uh, they did a talk on Hyperloop. I did a talk on um, how to build off-world. And then I think uh, there was a couple other folks here, Hypergiant and a few other folks that spoke as well on uh, space, but it was kind of boring compared to construction. <laughs> <laughs> so then did you just start talking with Sharia um, about the team? How did that sort of happen? Yeah, no, I was asking, uh, particularly uh, your levitation system. Uh, it's pretty unique um, out of all the student teams. Uh, so when they were actually talking about using uh, um, the air bearings for a levitation system, I just thought it was pretty fascinating uh, since your Hyperloop runs in a partial vacuum. So, um, hmm started asking him about that, but since Shari's business, uh, he was like, uh, I have some people you can talk to about that. <laughs> yeah, it's classic, it's classic business side. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. And I actually saw one of your tweets from like 2016, you were met, you were tweeting about the, the student competition. So have you been sort of following mm -hmm. it since then? Yeah, yeah, I have actually. Um, and it's, it's something that I've, it's technology I've always followed since, uh, you know, Musk released the white papers. I actually went out and read the white paper and thumbed through it just to see um, kind of what he had come up with. Because at the time, I believe it was right after um, I'd stopped working on the wire um, uh, because I was doing my own startup at the time instead. Um, <clears throat> as, I think that was right about the time maybe he released the white papers or so. I forget when the, the white papers were actually released. It may have been earlier than that. Um, Anyway, I was kind of curious in it because uh, Hyperloop seems to be a fantastic uh, regional, um, if not uh, also national kind of like transit system uh, if you ran lines that long. Uh, but particularly regionally, it seems to have like a lot of applications, which would dovetail perfectly with, uh, you know, a, a local transportation circulator like the wire concept. So I was kind of thinking wire local around Austin and then you hit your Hyperloop to go down to, um, you know, South Padre to watch a rocket launcher up to Dallas or over to Houston. So. Yeah. At least from a Texas, you know, a very Texas centered perspective. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. I heard you mentioned the wire a couple of times there. Do you want to kind of go into what that is and um, just kind of the idea and the concept there? Oh, sure. If I can even remember uh, all the details <laughs> about it now. Um, yeah. The wire actually um, was a, an urban, an urban cable system when, um, essentially uh, overhead gondolas uh, from ski lifts that we were uh, adapting as a mass transit uh, option for the city of Austin. Um, and it was a lot of fun trying to, um, we had a, a grassroots efforts we kind of mounted um, with uh, some designers from Frog. It started actually when I was a principal, or senior, sorry, principal designer at Frog, uh, started uh, this project trying to cross train a lot of the design staff um, and creatives at Frog. Uh, we were running the kind of cross train because I'm a weirdo that does a little bit of everything. So um, we were taking interaction designers and teaching on visual design, visual designers, teaching on design research, uh, researchers like turn around and showing them this is what it means to do interaction design. Um, and a great, a great way to kind of cross train um, all these different disciplines was to um, think about a transit, uh, a transit problem. Um, so we just started originally looking at uh, bus systems, evaluating Cap Metro, which 
was kind of cheating for me. That's why I was using it as a teaching project because I just worked on um, a lot of the cap metro projects at the job I had with Warfrog um, to work on the metro rail and a lot of the, the local transit systems here. Um, and I think they were still using a very mutated form of one of my maps on, on the bus system still at panel. But, um, so I had, a, I had a lot of knowledge, insider knowledge on Cap Metro. So I thought that would be a good safe spot. Um, but what was surprising is we got out and did the research and our research essentially came back that the best circulation system for Austin would be flying cars. Um, and it was like, well, how can you actually do flying cars with modern technology? Um, and one of the crazy technologists that uh, used to be at Prague, um, who's now over at Argo, uh, suggests, he was like, well, ski lifts. He was like, you know, I, I thought it was kind of silly, but we actually threw it in the mix and then started crunching numbers on it. And then once we actually started running uh, the math on it, uh, we're like, whoa, why aren't people using this? And it turns out they are. They use um, uh, gondolas like you would use at a ski resort um, in a lot of parts of uh, Central and South America, mm -hmm. uh, a few spots in Europe, uh, but it really hasn't taken off yet. People have talked about it, um, but when you look at all the modes of transit, um, it's by far the cheapest one you can put in. Um, it runs, depends on how frequently you put a station. Your ground stations are gonna be about $3 million in hardware to bolt down. Um, so you can essentially say that's your per mile cost because everything else is just a tower and a cable. Um, so super energy efficient, super green, um, super quiet, um, and doesn't really take away from local surface level real estate. And that's the biggest problem with light rail. Um, I've never been a big proponent of light rail. I love trains, um, but never really thought light rail was a great urban circulator solution because it, it takes away uh, essentially real estate on uh, the ground level, which is the most competitive real estate. Vehicles generally run on that unless they're running in a tunnel or an overpass above it, right? But that's pretty rare and it's pretty limited burst, not long distances. Um, unless you're talking about an elevated interstate. Um, so when you start looking at all the different modes of transit um, and how can you, you squeeze the most out of the 3D volume that is an urban center or city, um, going down like the boring companies uh, wanting to do or a potential even with Hyperloop, right? Burying Hyperloop instead of having above ground tunnels or tubes. Uh, that would be great and it's fine. But uh, when you look at boring, um, it's really expensive. Subways are about 400, $450 million a mile um, is where they start at. Um, so, and particularly below Austin with all their limestone caves and stuff and mm -hmm. springs and caverns. Uh, when they just extended Mopac um, last summer, they punched through an unknown cave system uh, at Slaughter Lane um, and had to like, stop work on it for months to cap it off. Um, so it's, it's a lot of things that digging in Austin, you just don't want to really dig, um, but you can go up you can do a flying car uh, and you can do it really, really, really cheap, like a fraction of cost of uh, essentially urban rail. So what does a gondola that system, was the <laughs> <laughs> so what does like a gondola system look like in a city like Austin? Like where are you putting, where are you putting the lines? How are you getting people in the gondolas? Oh yeah. yeah it looks like Gavin um, has some pictures here. Uh, a couple of photos. <laughs> this oh, one, that's some old this school one, rendering there. I just imagine like flying over ACL. <laughs> Like you get yeah, so we actually, well, we did, I mean, we did serious design research on this and um, a lot of business uh, research on this, uh, actually. Um, where we ended up, we ended up with um, a master plan, I believe that had, I want to say it was five, five wire lines, um, if I remember right. Um, the first line that we would actually terminate at Dilker Park would go, it would cross the river because um, that's one of the cool things about cable. Um, it's a cable. So there's no infrastructure or additional cost to cross a geographic barrier like a river, um, where if you're going to build a, um, a bridge over, um, uh, what are they calling it now? It's not Town Lake anymore, Lady Bird Lake. Um, if you build a bridge over that, that's $96 million uh, to build a bridge. Um, Congress, you can't, uh, you can't expand the Congress Bridge in Austin because it's uh, a protected ecosystem for the bats. You can't expand uh, Lamar Boulevard because it's a historical bridge, uh, it's a historical site. So you can't touch that. So you're left with First Street or you have to go to Mopac or 35 uh, or put in a whole new bridge and a whole new bridge is 93 to $96 million. Uh, cable just goes over it. Uh, it's no additional cost. You just span a cable over it, put a tower on each side and you're done. Mm -hmm. um, so what we were doing with uh, the wire one line started at the airport 
uh, it came over, it crossed. Um, we had a 3D designed route entrance into the city. So um, you actually leave the airport. We kind of keep it low and skim the ground there um, because you're at an airport uh, and keep you out of the airspace. Um, but once you crossed uh, the highway, we would actually have it where it peaks up and then we'd come in and out of the tree line uh, coming into the lake. So you actually get peaks of the Austin skyline and you get to stay down in the green belts um, and come along the golf course there. And then you cross the river and it kind of hugs the river. Um, it came into the convention center and then uh, wire one went from the convention center over to Zilker Park, um, kind of running down the lake and then crossing over. Uh, so we thought that line would be pretty epic first line because you could take that and come into South by Southwest, ACL, um, just about every event could be serviced with that and out to the airport um, and feeds right into downtown. Um, we're like, that would be a good foundational line. And then we had, of course, uh, north and west um, lines. So if you look at where our roadways have kind of built up, um, those clogged arteries have kind of grown in our city. Uh, it's always north and south circulators. Um, so you have Mopac and 35 that kind of frame the city. Um, so we had some lines that went north and south, of course, um, uh, because the like London, Austin is a is weird kind of geographically where we're split with a river, uh, mm -hmm. a geographic barrier. Um, so crossing that is um it's a huge bottleneck i know when i used to work downtown uh i could add 20 minutes to my commute um just to cross the river um in rush hour and that that's no fun um but the wire would allow us to do all of that um super cheap um we even had subscription models where we'd looked at the business models on it um it would actually work as a private company um it just required a 100 million dollar startup capital and i was like i didn't think i could raise that so um, I tried to save the world a different way. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> One thing that I found really interesting about the wire is that in your talk on YouTube, you mentioned like it's a much better way to be introduced to the city, um, which is something that I really did not thought about. And that made me think about like flying into a city for the first time. It's like one of the coolest experiences, like looking down, seeing like everything. Yeah. Um, so That's just, like, one of the coolest things about the wire. Um, Barcelona, Barcelona, Spain actually has an extension there, subway line uh, that it transitions. You can come out of the subway, you go up what's called a funticular, which is just like a car pulled up a steep slope on train tracks. And then you you swap from the funticular over to an actual gondola system and go all the way up to the, the mountainsides in Barcelona where the uh, Olympic Village was. Uh, but what's really cool is um, riding up, it's just quiet and you're just kind of cruising along, but you're, you're constantly gaining elevation and you're just getting a bigger and bigger um, kind of vantage point for the entire city that kind of sits at the base of the mountain uh, below you. So it's, it's really elegant. Um, and that's something that public transit is not really synonymous with, right, is elegance um, mm -hmm. or experience. Um, I mean, when you think of experience and public transit, everyone's mind always goes to the New York subway system and, you know, thinking rats or you know, um, all kinds of dirty bodily fluids. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah the grease, you know. is that, like you would each have your own private pod, which is like yeah. pretty underrated. Um, that was underrated. Um, we actually later crunched the math. The, the gondolas would have to be a little larger, um, mm -hmm. but not big. We're talking like 10 person gondolas instead of four, but uh, you could still run the four person gondolas. It just depends on the volume that a line would have to have. Mm -hmm. um, and that was one thing the rail lobbyist, um, Cap Metro, you see even in some of the, the transit meetings is it was a joke about the wire every time. Um, uh, but that was one of the things that they had always hit us with. I was like, well, you can't, you can't actually move that much capacity with it. And it's like, it moves 5,000 people per hour in each direction. It's, that's a lot of people. You know, that's 5,000 cars an hour off the highway. I was like, that makes a dent. Yeah. So. You can't so move a technical you can't question. Place that many with a bus. So. <laughs> yeah. So how how far away can you have the posts between between uh the the line there? Depends on the size of the post. Did y'all look? Did y'all <laughs> like try to Seriously, optimize for that, like a maximum? Uh no, but the, if you look at um, ski lifts, so um, up at uh, was it Whistler maybe, um, or maybe in British. Yeah, I think in uh, British Columbia, there's actually a, a cableway that spans peak to peak. And I want to say that may be two miles uh, oh, wow. between your, your limits. Um, and I'm probably totally wrong on that. You, somebody can Google fact check me on that one. Um, but uh, it's, Jamie, pull that it's, up. A, it's a big span. Yeah, it goes from peak to peak. So it's a big span. 
Um, so you can span stuff as long as um, you can build a big enough tower to support it, essentially. Your only distance limits on um, gondolas as they are right now, um, that's generally uh, the length of the cable. You can only go about 13 miles because um, you have to double that length, um, essentially for your cable running on a wheel. And there's just, at some point you get too big of a wheel of cable um, to be manageable, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, I want to rewind. Really your only physical limitation. I want to rewind just a little bit. What's that? I can see that yeah. you have your electric bike there, um, and I have just more of a general question. Like you seem to be a very oh, crafty sure. and like have a lot of workshop experience. Is that something that you got like from your parents growing up, or where did that where did that come from? Uh, no, was, my parents. Uh, my mother's a painter, um, so she taught me to draw when I was, um, I think, two or three. Um, drunk stick cats and stuff to keep me quiet I think um, but she's a painter so I kind of learned I've always appreciated art and have been painting and drawing since I was since I can remember really um, uh, my dad was a uh, was just a full-out businessman I mean he owned a trucking company so um, uh, it was a lot of time for me as a kid was in sawmills uh, being horrified by foremen who like to take you from the catwalks and show you, you know, a 20 foot diameter saw blade spinning at, you know, 6,000 RPM and ask you, it's like, hey, you know what happens when your arm gets caught on that? <laughs> you know, yeah. like, the wheel death. So I guess yeah. that, maybe that out of fear, it bred a lot of interest in machinery to me. But um, no, I've always, um, I've drawn um, Martian cities, moon villages, trains of the future, any kinds of forms of transit and stuff since I mean, since I was a kid, so. Um, but you've always been interested in, in, like, space as well. Oh, yeah, no, I, I was, my plan in high school when I first got my driver's license was um, I was going to go in the Air Force, which I'm not a, a military person, but I was going to go in the Air Force because I wanted to be a fighter pilot and then I was going to be an astronaut mm -hmm. um, because that's the only profession anybody really tells you about for space when you're a kid. Yeah, that's um, true. Especially, um, before this kind of new era in space that we're in now, uh, the new space economy. We have commercial interest and there's new jobs, yep. new types of jobs needed there too. Um, but as a kid, I mean, you could hope you could get to be an astronaut for the government and the government would strap you to something really expensive and big and loud and goes really fast and yep. fire you off the planet. You know, that was, your, nice, that was your only hope. Give you a nice Corvette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the Apollo maybe. <laughs> um, no, I've always been, uh, I've always loved space. I watched every shuttle launch when I was a kid, went to space camp as soon as I was old enough. Um, just always have been, I've been a nerd. So, um, I made model rockets. Um, that was probably one of my biggest passions as a kid was, you know, building rockets and blowing them up and losing them and <laughs> all the fun that comes with burnt, catching things on fire with rockets. So, mm -hmm. so I've always tinkered. It's just, I don't know. It's who I am, I guess. <laughs> so where was the shift kind of from wanting to ride on a rocket to kind of wanting to be more of someone building and kind of behind the scenes type of stuff? Uh, probably just a lack of options and opportunity. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, the astronaut thing uh, washed out pretty quick. When I was 16, I had to have glasses. So that kind of, without 2020 vision, you can't be a fighter pilot. Um, so I was like, well, that's kind of the end of the road for that. The astronaut career and that was be before i knew that they actually had engineers and stuff that went up you know everyone thinks of the the chuck yeager astronaut or not astronauts but like test pilots and then astronauts yeah and stuff. test pilot um, maverick you know yeah yeah so that was kind of always probably more alluring to me uh than anything um and then after that i was going to be a doctor um so i actually went to college and uh started in pre-med um but then uh, i lost my father to cancer at the end of my freshman year in college um and after that, I was like, oh, gosh, um, that was kind of, you know, everything in my entire world changed. Safety net's gone, everything. It's like, okay, well, now what? Um, and I went to the Career Aptitude Center, the Career Service Center at Mississippi State, um, took a computer aptitude test, not joking. Um, and it came back with the first option being architect. The second one was uh, graphic design, industrial design, fashion design, like every form of kind of creative profession that they had. Um, and then I went through the course catalog for state and they offered graphic design and architecture. Graphic design was less math. That's essentially how I ended up being a designer. Uh, but it's worked out pretty well for me. So, Yeah, for sure. I would definitely say so. <laughs> I bet your mom was happy about that, right? 
you want the graphic designer. <laughs> yeah, but she's a fine artist. So it, sometimes it's kind of hard to understand, um, you know, when I'm talking about an invention or something I've built or designed um, or, you know, software you've made or something. It's like, it's kind of hard to explain, explain it sometimes. So. Right. It's not like a painting or a sculpture, you know, it's, it's much more tangible. Mm -hmm. Yep. At times. <laughs> Um, and so then what did you do after you graduated? Was that McKinsey or was that Frog? <laughs> yeah, no, I've, I've forced got my way around through history and all over the place. Um, no, I graduated um, from Mississippi State and I'm, my first job was in California. Um, and I did a lot of branding uh, for startups and the first dot-com boom. That's how old I am. Um, <clears throat> so I moved out to uh, Silicon Valley, lived out there for a couple of years. Um, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, uh, finished law school and then um, moved out to California with me. Um, so we had a lot of fun out there uh, until we were, she was homesick and ready to come back home. She's a Texan. So I kind of married into Texas. Um, so she wanted to come home. I was fine with that. So we, we moved to Texas um, and I got a job um, uh, with a design firm that was doing, at the time it was before anybody did user experience design or UI designers weren't a thing, um, oh. not in like a formal way that they are now, at least. Um, design research was, we called it ethnographic based field research because there was no design research. Um, there was no value of design in business. You know, this oh. jobs was actually, you know, making it, um, making the demonstration <laughs> for everyone essentially with this return to Apple at the time. So, um, so it was a different time, um, but it was also kind of awesome because we got to pioneer a lot of, a lot of stuff that is just kind of what's taken for granted now. It's like, it's, that's just design research. And it's like, there was no classes for this stuff <laughs> back in the day when we did it. So, um, but we started out doing um, what kind of changed. I was doing basically print design and logos and branding, um, kind of iconography, that kind of stuff. Um, because it, to me at the time, it was like, this is the pinnacle of creativity. Uh, you've got to symbolize something as complex, you know, as this multinational conglomerate company down into one little simple symbol. Um, and I thought that was the end all be all until I started working with um, in healthcare, um, and in particularly with patient experience in healthcare. Um, so we did a, we did a job um, at that design firm I joined in Texas. Um, for MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston. Uh, and that was kind of a special thing to me since I lost my father to cancer. Um, I was like, well, they told him his one only hope would be to go to MD Anderson. He's like, I'm not going to Texas. Um, but went down there working with the folks at MD Anderson um, and all of the volunteers there are all cancer survivors who were told the same thing my father was, but because they went to MD Anderson, um, you know, they were actually alive. So um, worked on a big project there where we actually built an entire patient experience system for them. Um, MD Anderson at the time, I think it expanded to 10 million square feet. And I'm talking like not shopping mall, 10 million square feet. I'm talking, well, that's 10 times the size of Barton Creek Mall. But, um, 10 million square feet of like dense doctor's offices and cl uh, clinics and labs and steam oh. tunnels. I mean, it's um, three, we Massive. used to call it a 3D hamster. Yeah, 3D hamster cage. The irony being it's like, kind of like a tumor. It had just, all these buildings had grown together and it spread out. And you couldn't tell where one building stopped and started if you were a patient inside. So we designed a whole experience system uh, that would let you quickly navigate 10 million square feet uh, in a matter of minutes using some touch screens. And this was way back in the day before they were iPad and stuff. So touch was crazy. Um, we had touch screens um, that actually printed out little receipts. And then we had icon based landmarks throughout the 10 million square feet. So if your doctor's office was near, say, like the aquarium, uh, everything it would direct you to a fish, um, all the signage uh -huh. and everything. And we had certain hallways designated like interstate highways uh, with special um, paint and carpet and signage. Uh, so when you got on those, it was like being on the interstate where you had your mileage markers and kind of like, here's where my exits are. And uh, it worked tremendously well. Um, but that was the first time where I watched um, doing follow-up research after we put the system in. Um, I watched a 16 year old oncology patient walk over to a kiosk you know, that I had designed, um, use this interface that I had designed on the screen, um, grabbed her receipt and looked down at her directions and then looked at the icons all of them that I had designed. It was like, picked out her icon for her doctor, looked up in the sign and all the arrows were pointing and she was like, 
looked at her parents and she's like, this is fantastic. Come on. And she ran the chemo. Um, and my wife being an attorney used to make jokes. We said, when we first got married, she was like, why are the TV shows about doctors and lawyers and cops and no shows about designers? Um, and she was like, baby, that's because we deal with life and death. Um, so after that experience in MD Anderson, I was like, that's where I realized kind of the power of design and how you could apply it in very targeted surgical ways. Um, and I actually do what's kind of in the business world they think is like black magic. And it's like, it's not, it's just, it's a specific application of kind of a creative mindset. So, but that kind of changed everything for me. And then from there I went, um, did all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, invented some housing systems and automated driving systems. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the housing system. I think we can do that. We can do that next. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's like, yeah, that was one of the crazy things. <laughs> yeah. So this later, pretty well. Frog and all kinds of other places. So. Um, yeah. So you said that's like 2003. That's when Katrina, right? Um, uh, 2005 about, is when Katrina hit. Uh, yeah. Okay. 2005. Yeah. Can you talk about sort of what that meant to you and why you were inspired to create reaction and, and like your, your vision for that? Yeah. Reactions is still kind of hard to talk about a little bit for me sometimes. Cause it's still like the, my wife and I were joke that it's, it was like the death of a child here for us. Um, the way that thing ended up. But um, now in 2005, uh, Hurricane Katrina hit. And then right after that, two weeks later, we had a second, second punch with another storm. Um, and the thing that, I grew up in the coast. Um, so growing up in hurricanes and the swamp, that was just, that's where I grew up. So um, it's something I knew. Um, and we always joked, even as a kid, like when the levees break in New Orleans, you know, it's toast. It was only engineered to a certain storm category. I mean, it wasn't a secret or anything. It's like, was New Orleans still there? You know, after every hurricane. And then Katrina hit um, and the levees broke. Uh, and it, it really, really bothered me because um, the boogeyman for me as a kid, um, every hurricane was always compared to Camille, Hurricane Camille. You know, it was like what all the old folks used to talk about, Hurricane Camille. And, and Katrina came in and was bigger and stronger. Um, but the way we, the way the federal government, when I say we, collective we, with us as humanity, I guess, um, the way we responded to Katrina was exactly the same way that we had responded to Camille almost 40 years before. Um, and that was with travel trailers and ad hoc response. And I was like, it just baffled me um, because hurricanes are forecastable. They're the only natural disaster you see coming. And I was like, why? Why are we not prepared for this? Uh, and then, uh, so it's like, what, what would you need out of this? Um, and when you look at a disaster response, you know, you get down the, um, you know, your basic human need, the food, water, and shelter. Um, and the one that I thought that would be a good one to take off the board for all of humanity was shelter. Um, so it kind of became an obsession of mine. I used to do a lot of freelance work. Um, so even when I was doing all this kind of experiential design work and um, transit work and, and stuff like that, um, to get kind of my kicks out, I would do a lot of freelance work and uh, at night and on the weekends and stuff doing uh, logos and just regular kind of design stuff. But I threw all that aside instead of putting energy into that stuff, um, it's probably when I first made my first garage workshop, actually, as an adult um, at our old house, um, and started just trying to make it myself. I was like, well, uh, there's got to be, and I drew up like all kinds of different housing things, built a bunch of different types of prototypes in my garage, um, and I was drinking coffee one day, and that's where I came up with the exo idea, because um, the coffee cup stacked um, and a big sleeve of them. I was like, Man, I can move a lot of houses if they sleeved houses like coffee cups. Um, and then it just kind of became a thing that I worked on. It was a passion project for uh, 10 years um, before I finally eventually left Frog um, and had some investors um, that invested in me. Um, they really believed in it um, and tried to make a go of it. So, so yeah, I think you said that. That's how it all got started. I think you said it takes me like 45 days to get those trailers there. And I think uh, in, your, in your videos, you said that like they, it was forecastable, but they didn't really prepare for it. And they ended up going to these lots and buying these trailers for like three times over sticker. Um, and it just seemed well, like a yeah. super efficient way. 
to respond to it. Supply and demand, and everyone always overcharges the government too. So yeah. um, those travel trailers, they were paying, you know, one hundred twenty thousand dollars and ninety thousand dollars for trailers that you wouldn't pay. They were like MSRP was about nineteen thousand if you bought it off the lot without haggling, right? Um, so it was just kind of a ridiculous waste all around. Uh, there was, you know, government funds spent on cruise ships, and we're going to put people on cruise ships, you know, and mm -hmm. like. Now, mm -hmm. still in a, pand a global pandemic, that's probably really horrifying to a lot of people um, that you would send cruise ships into a disaster area where you have stagnant water and, you know, disease. But, you know, whatever. Yeah. Uh, we spent it on cruise ships. We spent it on uh, travel trailers, hotels. People lived in hotels forever. No one really remembers that. Um, but you, if you got anywhere close to, like, southern Louisiana, you didn't have a hotel room. Like, hotel rooms were booked out for um, – through most of Mississippi, Eastern Texas, like you, because the entire population was displaced. And what, um, you know, disaster response is typically, if you, if you study it in school, right, the disaster response officially ends when the tax base recovers. Well, New Orleans still hasn't recovered from Katrina. Yeah. Um, they permanently yeah. displaced over half the city's population, half the tax base. So there's a financial incentive there. Um, and that was, that was the whole premise behind reaction was not to make money on anything. Um, but it was like, how can we build businesses that last, um, that have impact that are set up to do something good. Um, but the only way to get people excited and motivated by it to actually invest in it, um, was that you have to be profitable and to be profitable is like, you have to be able to turn out volume. Um, so that's why we were looking at applications like, um, pop-up hotels with Hyatt for Coachella and um, lots of different kind of applications for the product. Um, and because of the design um, and some of the system features for disaster response, it had a lot of other applications. Um, yeah. And we had a huge sales pipeline built up. But, you know, when you're a startup, it's cash is king. So, it's like, if you don't close that, that funding round fast, then you're dead. So, so being like a graphic designer, was this the first, you know, like, material object that you designed? Uh, it wasn't the first one, but it was probably the first one that had any kind of notoriety to it. I did a exactly. lot of, um, um, well, at the firm I was at before Frog, um, so I was never an industrial designer formally at Frog. Um, I was a visual designer and interaction designer and design researcher, um, which was kind of all three of the creative roles that Frog had on staff. Um, but I didn't do, they had industrial design uh, in two studios worldwide, but um, I was never on the industrial design team there. Um, the place I was at before Frog, um, I, I worked in what's, it's a hybrid weird field, which is perfect for a weirdo like me. Um, it's called environmental graphic design. Uh, and it's kind of an in-between gray area design discipline that um, sits between architecture, graphic design, and um, I guess probably industrial design and with a dash of interior design. I don't know. Uh, where it's, and then that's where I was doing a lot of transportation work. Um, so designing um, all kinds of transportation systems, um, ways to move passengers through airports, um, way to move patients through hospitals, um, how, to, how to find buses and trains more efficiently, you know, depending on which public transit system we were working with, um, how to get business districts, how they can move um, customers, you know, fluidly around, you know, business districts to the businesses and stuff. And it all sounds silly, but it's all called wayfinding. Um, and people used to make fun. It's like, so you, you designed signage when I was doing that way back in the day. And it was, and it was, it was always fun. Cause I took a junior designer one time we were traveling in, in Chicago and took some blue tape out. And I was like, here's the power of design. And I walked out in the middle of O'Hare airport and I put some blue masking tape and just made a line right down the center of the uh, jetway there. And just tore it off and then went over and sat back down with him and started drinking coffee. And he was like, what, what's so great about blue tape and design? And I was like, just watch. And it was like, people thoughtlessly would segregate on the lines. So in the U.S., it, you know, the driver's always on the left side. Uh, but everyone, if you're going in that direction, you're going to go on the right side of something. Mm -hmm. If you put down a line, people won't even think about it. They'll just <laughs> split. It's just built um, into your brain so you at that people point. That just, yeah, it's hardwired, right? So, um, so it's like people started, you know, filing past, you know, they weren't just this mob just crashing through each other. It's like, I was like, that's, it's a piece of color, a colored line on the floor. Uh, and you can actually move people without them knowing you did it. So. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to show this real quick. 
This is an XO. Yep. Yeah, those are old school ones. I found this really interesting because you talk a lot about like culture and like it has to look good and people have to feel good using it in order to, for it to like be adoptable. And I mean, this thing looks really good. Yeah. And it was, they were nice. I spent a lot of nights in them. Yeah. My kids and I used to have campouts in there when they were little, little. I think you, I think you mentioned that like your AC went out and so you went and slept in one in your backyard. Yeah. Yeah, the dog and I slept in there a couple nights. Um, the dog was my co-test pilot. That was actually the first time I ever slept in one because um, I just finished a rapid prototype. It didn't last the summer because the materials I used were stupid and they essentially turned to dust in the Texas heat. But you learn. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, well, I got another great transition. When I first saw that, yeah. it reminded me of like a space habitat. Um, so Very spicy for sure. <laughs> Yeah, it looks very futuristic and it looks like it should be on the moon. Um, so <laughs> that was a 20 year roadmap for reaction. Uh, yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that yeah, that's us, what's funny about what I do now. So, yep, that brings us to Icon. Uh, can you talk about like what Icon <laughs> is and how you got involved? Yeah, sure. Um, so, Icon is a construction technology company. Um, or that's what we say is just a kind of a simplistic handle. Um, but basically Icon, we, we design, build um, giant construction robotics. Um, they're basically rolling 3D printers and they print with uh, concrete uh, to print homes. Uh, so uh, Icon can print uh, entire homes. Uh, we focused a lot over the past two years on uh, homelessness and affordable housing. Um, but we're getting into all kinds of other homes. So these are some homes uh, that you're showing right now. Uh, that's Community First Village. Um, so we printed those homes, we printed all three of those at one time by one printer. So that printer was just rolling back and forth on the slab, printing three houses at a time. Uh, these are actually for um, people that have never had homes. Um, they're chronic homeless. Um, and actually Tim uh, uh, is the first, um, first person to live in a 3D printed house, like as his permanent residence in the United States. Yeah, and he lives right out in Community First Village in it. Yeah, wow. that's the Chacon house. That was the first one uh, that Icon did. So that was built back with the, the very first Vulcan 1 prototype printer. Uh, and that's actually in our head of construction. That's in his backyard. It's his actually home office. So uh, when we've been doing calls through the pandemic, he's the only one of us actually calling in from a 3D printed house because it's his <laughs> office. <laughs> so how long does one of these take to print? Uh, you can print our general rule of thumb uh, with the current generation of technology we've got right now out in the field. Uh, it's about 500 square feet in, uh, for 24 hours. Um, so the Chacon house was under 500 square feet. Um, so it printed in, in less than a day. Um, the Community First Village and the ones that are on the uh, Apple TV Plus show home uh, down in uh, Nacajuca, Mexico. Those are all small format because they're meant to be um, affordable housing. Um, and kind of affordable price points, but we have printed um, homes up to 2,500 square feet. Um, yeah, and that's what's cool about the robots is like they never get tired; they just keep printing. So. And what material is this? Is this just concrete? Uh, it's a special mix of. Well, it's a special mix of concrete because um, concrete has to do as um, Jason Valerie, our CEO, used, likes to say, is uh, has to do a lot of black magic uh, because you're having to take a concrete in any weather condition. Um, it's got to be fluid enough to go through, you know, 150 feet of hoses and pipes uh, to get to the nozzle. And then when it comes out that nozzle, it needs to set super fast uh, and it needs to stay super strong and it shouldn't crack. Um, if it's raining on it, it shouldn't melt in the rain. If it's too cold, it should still uh, harden. If it's too hot, it shouldn't get soupy. You know, it's like, it's got to do some crazy stuff. So um, we actually have um, an entire material science team and a material science lab at ICOM. Um, and that is all they do um, is actually develop some wild, crazy materials. Um, they can make concrete do cementitious materials to be, I guess, technical about it, uh, do just about anything we could possibly want them to do. Um, and it's, it's been a lot of fun working with the material science team, especially with some of the work I'm doing now. So, how so having you... some friends uh, in construction science, I know a big thing with concrete is like, especially in Texas, um, is the heat. And, you know, mm -hmm. you're pouring at night and you're keeping it watered down and all this stuff. Is that something that you need to worry about here as well? Uh, our technology 
helps us uh, and compensates and that. Uh, and we have our kind of special formulas um, that we use for this stuff. So it's just you print um, it and it's done. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's like any concrete, right? It takes 27 mm -hmm. days to reach fuel cure, curing strength, but I mean, it's load bearing generally in about 24 hours. So this doesn't depends on the like, weather conditions. This That's doesn't amazing. need any frames to help it. It just prints on top of itself like a normal 3D printer. Yeah. yeah. That's probably been the, one of the bigger engines, like kind of when you're thinking more civil engineering kind of uh, challenges uh, with 3D printed houses, it's like, that's concrete. So yeah. it's a lot of thermal mass, but it's also a lot of weight. So the foundations have to be a lot stronger. Uh, and in Austin, like foundations are all over the place. So um, you can print like three houses in the same neighborhood and there may be three different types of foundations required depending on the terrain the house is on, uh, whether it's in a sandy creek bottom or it's on a limestone rock. Um, so, but these houses are heavy. So you have to compensate for um, that kind of load because you're, you're printing an entire house with concrete. So is this, is like the printer something that you just roll up like on a semi-truck and then plop it down and start doing the same? Oh, it's not even on a semi-truck. The, uh, the Vulcans right now, um, they can print 28 feet wide, um, eight and a half feet tall and infinitely long essentially because um, you keep moving them back. So they, our Vulcan printer is a giant gantry robot. Um, and it moves back and forth on train tracks, essentially, um, huh. some, some rails, wide rails. Um, so it's kind of like if you take your desktop 3D printer um, and you take the bed off and you put, instead of a bed, it's, um, it's on tracks. Um, so that's essentially, I mean, and that's a really dumb way of looking at um, the Vulcan geometry, but that's essentially, a, I'm trying to give you a mental picture of what it looks like. Yeah. There's pictures of it out there everywhere, though. So, so I'm wondering... The giant robot. Before you joined, was Icon already looking into getting into space, or is that something that you <laughs> that you brought to the table? No. Um, so um, I got to know Icon. Um, I'm friends with um, with Jason Ballard, the CEO, and then uh, Evan Loomis, who's one of the co-founders. Um, we've been friends for um, a while, especially Loomis and I. Um, and Jason's a space nerd too. Um, like me, he's just as a since a kid loves it. Um, He's a nerd too. So, um, you know, nerds read a lot um, and get into their passions and stuff. So space has always been one of his. So um, when I've been out um, at McKenzie, when I was talking commercial space and commercial space opportunities with the new space economy uh, a lot um, to a lot of people's discomfort, um, Jason was already, he was actually forming LLCs to make space mining companies and stuff and already thinking there. Um, so he was already thinking it. Um, so what year it just happened to be, uh, see, Icon's only been around for two years. So, um, this was, I met, uh, or I joined last year. So in January, 2020, um, but that was to join kind of, um, an overall space program, um, where Icon is working with NASA on, on right. Artemis, uh, for the lunar base, um, which would be for pan, uh, you know, permanent manned, uh, living or, uh, human, human occupation, I guess, <laughs> human settlement of the moon. Um, and yeah, those are some of the shelters. Um, so we have two architectural partners on the project um, that are working with us. And this is probably the first time that um, I think NASA has ever let design lead. Um, so uh, Project Olympus is what we call it. That's our project to develop the moon printer and construction system. So it's more than just a printer because it's a quarter of a million miles away from us on the moon. Um, you can't here on earth, you know, we have, you know, a print captain who is kind of like the pilot for the, uh, for the, the Vulcan robot here on our construction sites. And we have a magma captain, our magma system is our concrete, uh, mixing and, um, and, uh, kind of pumping systems. Um, and we have an operator for that, but on the moon, we can't. So all that has to run with a one second latency, um, and we can't touch it. Um, so Project Olympus is looking at how would we do autonomous construction um, and do it solely with ISRU, um, so in-situ resource utilization. Um, and this is like one of the fundamental game-changing kind of technologies that can use ISRU or um, are going to be fundamental to the expansion of humanity into space as reusable rockets. Um, reusable rockets drive down our launch cost um, 
and allow uh, faster travel times. Yeah, <laughs> Starship right there. Um, um, so uh, that that's key to opening up space. But how do you stay in space is what you have to be able to use the resources that are there. And if the universe is infinite, then we have infinite resources. Um, and the moon's no different. People will look at moon dust and we're like, well, how would you do anything with it? And in the past, a lot of people have looked at um, all different kinds of ways you can make something with moon dust. Um, it's, it has some wild properties to it. Um, some really crazy science when you actually start looking at what real moon dust does and how it behaves and why it behaves that way. Um, but uh, most people try to mix it with something. So it's called a binder. So um, with concrete, um, you know, you have, you have a couple of pieces that you, you put together, you add water and it all mixes together. Um, Portland cement, uh, the actual cement is your binder agent, right? So it's your, it's the thing that sticks all the rocks and sand all together. Um, so people have done, uh, there's some companies like AI Space Factory that did, uh, it would mix thermoplastics with it. So like your basic, your 3D printing filament uh, stuff, and they would mix it with uh, Martian regolith, which is Martian dirt, or uh, lunar regolith, uh, moon dust. Um, and they would get a building material out of that, but it also has the same properties, a lot of the same properties as the binder agent, which is plastic. Um, what we've been doing with Project Olympus is developing pure ISRU technology. So we take nothing but moon dust and it runs through our devices and wow. it comes out as a building material. Um, and so far we've developed a couple of different, we've looked at all kinds of stuff. So it's been a lot of fun to be able to experiment with just about, I think Jason likes to joke that we have looked at the entire electromagnetic spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's pretty much right. I, we generally have in the lab, um, but we have, two methods that are in, and two different types of uh, devices uh, right now in the, in, in the lab that are, that are working really well at bench top levels. And we've actually taken just moon dust, run them through these devices and um, generated a building material that is, you know, four to five times stronger than high strength concrete here on earth. Um, so that kind of stuff is extremely fun and exciting. And that's where I get to nerd out with the material science team a lot because they get to go and, take the samples I produce <laughs> and then try to break them and characterize them and determine what is this and how did it get this way? Um, so it's, it's been a lot of fun. Have you heard of Lunar Resources? Yeah. It's a company in Houston. So I recently yeah. uh, heard an interview with one of the guys that's working there. And it's something I hadn't thought about before. He's like, the moon is actually a really good place to like manufacture since you don't have to worry about weathering and it's like basically a clean room. And that's like something yeah. that you didn't really think about. Like you think of the moon as yeah, that's what, an exotic place. He's like, it's actually really great because it's a clean room. You don't have to worry about oxidation. There's no rain. I was like, wow. Yeah, there's no oxidation, which can be a good or a bad thing, depending on what you're trying to do, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's certain like types of heating elements and stuff that actually need oxygen and they need oxidation as a process to actually function. Um, uh, so it's a lot of interesting characteristics. Like the moon is really cool. Um, I am all for moon and Mars, um, but Mars is way easier, a lot harder to get to, way easier to build on than the moon. The moon is a whole different ball game. If you're talking about moon, earth, and Mars, um, the moon is the only one that is in a hard back. Um, yeah. So water supplements, you can't mix concretes on the moon surface because the water just instantly is gone. Right. Um, so you can't mix anything. Um, if you can't mix anything, then it's like, okay, well, what can you, can you add something to it? Um, can you run it through a thermal process? You know, it's like, how, can, what can you actually do with just this powdery stuff? Because when you actually look at uh, lunar regolith, it is super, super fine, like yeah. 250 microns, like it's baby powder, but finer. Um, and yeah. it's a, the real stuff is abrasive because there is no, there's no atmosphere, there's no wind, rain, water to smooth it off like sand grains on the beach. So all of these are kind of like just couple birds. They're all super sharp and they stick to everything. Um, and that's what people don't realize is like, well, we've already been to the moon. I was like, we went to the moon. We've had six camping trips to the moon. The moon is this, has the landmass of North America. So do you really think you've seen all of North America with six camping trips? Um, and even the longer Apollo missions that say three days, um, a lunar day is 14 Earth days. 
um, because of the rotation and its orbit. So you have 14 days of light. All the Apollo missions were essentially timed on purpose to land at essentially high noon on the moon. Yeah. And the longest we stayed after three days, we essentially left at 3 p.m. So <laughs> we have never seen in person a lot of the lunar weather. Um, and that's something that very poorly um, misunderstood um, about the moon because we just simply don't know because we, we haven't observed it and haven't been able to observe it until we go back. So what does it take to get a lunar 3D printer? Is this something that just a single uh, payload could get there? Or how, how many trips would it take to get all the parts? Just one. Um, one. So we just depends on which launch vehicle you're looking at. Um, Starship was not was never intended to go to the moon. Uh, the lunar variant of it um, is interesting, but it's not a cargo. It's not a lunar cargo variant of it. It's kind it's of a the fun stuff in the moon. Yeah, yeah, but uh, the Starship could do it. Um, yeah, the Starship sure. will require landing pads, though, um, to be there if you're going to land. Try to do a descent with Raptor engines firing, um, and that's one thing that people don't really realize. One of the fun things about the Moon, um, since it's covered with a very, very, very fine powder across the whole surface, um, and it's in a vacuum, uh, rocket exhaust doesn't go straight down like it does here on Earth because you have an atmosphere holding the rocket exhaust down. It expands outward. Uh, and when that gas expands outward, it takes everything else with it and pushes it as fast as it's expanding outward. So if you have a rocket engine coming down with 10,000 pounds of thrust, that thrust is pushing all that dust out. So even the little Apollo, the Apollo limbs uh, had about 10,000 pounds of thrust on descent. Um, they actually sent dust orbital. So Phil Metzger um, has some great talks and some, um, some great videos uh, kind of explaining some of the simulations and stuff that they've run on this. But uh, the Apollo landers actually take moon dust orbital around the moon uh, into orbit, and it comes back in at, at hypersonic speed. So you have essentially a dust storm coming in that fast. Um, so without landing pads and ways to control that um, exhaust, there have been some studies, and there is concern that um, – with enough commercial traffic going on the moon, we essentially flute the moon <laughs> where we have a haze around the moon from us just taking up so much moon dust from activity. And you ha that's what would happen if you didn't have landing pads there. Um, but that's all a digression off of Starship. Um, Starship is awesome. Um, uh, our system will fit in Starship. It, of course, will fit on um, uh, New Glenn um, atop a blue moon lander. Uh, the way we currently have it, I mean, it's so early on, right? Because um, we're not going to fly for a couple years now. Um, so we have a lot of rapid prototyping stuff. But in its current form, as we, as we have uh, been working on it so far, um, we could get two of those on top of a blue moon lander inside of a new Glenn. Um, and then that would give us one shot. You'd have two printers, um, two printers on the surface on, up there. On top of the lander. Yeah, because wow. of that. Because... Um, when you're looking at the diameter of New Glenn, it's uh, smaller than a Starship. So Starship's about what 30 feet. Um, New Glenn's around 22 feet. Um, so when you look at the inside of the fairing, uh, you essentially have a 20 foot deck, um, and then about what 45, 55 feet uh, in the payload fairing. So um, the Olympus designs that we have, um, that we currently have. Um, are a very, what we call a boom tower. Um, so it's a very vertical arrangement, um, so, but it's very much like a construction crane uh, that you would see um, any kind of standard construction crane you see all over downtown Austin right now. Uh, the difference being is our, our jib, our jib arm. So if you think of this is your construction tower and this is your jib arm um, that moves and it has your dolly, it goes back and forth and lifts your stuff. Um, the way Olympus is currently conceived is it's a tower like that, but our jib arm actually folds. Um, so it can get fold up vertical. So when it's all vertical and packaged up, two Olympus sprinters in theory could fit on top of a, blue, a single blue moon lander. Uh, the bigger blue moon lander, the HLS size ones, which have a 10 metric ton capacity. Um, so the printers would be riding down. So if in this scenario, if they rode down on blue moon, uh, they, would, they would land there, um, they'd be offloaded off of blue moon, and then uh, they essentially have to drive themselves to their construction site which should be near the lander, hopefully. Um, and then they are, um, they're essentially fed by excavators. So um, NASA's Razor is a great example of a, um, a, a low gravity excavator. 
design. Um, so something like a razor um, or a different type of excavator would essentially just feed Olympus moon dust. And it would take that moon dust and convert it into um, essentially like an ultra high strength ceramic. Um, and that's what the structure would be printed out of. Wow. Um, and then I don't know if you can talk about this, but where would you get your power from? Uh, that's the fun part. So NASA is telling everyone uh, looking at going to the moon and uh, cislunar space commercially over the next decade uh, not to worry about power. Power will be there. Um, and so that's power an interesting and policy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> don't so don't really worry good. about um, it. It's there. <laughs> um, yeah. So we've been sizing our system. Um, our system will actually could run on a, uh, some very large battery packs that you're recharging with solar. Um, it wouldn't print that fast because you would be power limited. Um, ideally, um, RTGs or modified RTGs um, would be what you would want to use for power uh, for something that could be self-contained and mobile um, that would have the power demands of a full Olympus system. Uh, because our, the devices and technology we have right now are very, very cool, um, but they are power hungry. I mean, we're not talking like they're not crazy, something like out of a comic book where, you know, the city, all the city lights dim when we turn it on or anything. But um, it is definitely something, uh, you know, it's, it's bigger than a flashlight. So uh, in space, that, that requires a lot of thought and, and calculations on your power. So I noticed on the Earth 3 printed houses, obviously you start with a foundation already there and then you print off of that. Um, but obviously on the moon, that's not a luxury that you get. Um, so how did you kind of have to change the design or change your strategy, uh, to, to be able to work around that? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, so what's really awesome is this is probably like I was mentioning earlier, uh, the first time that NASA's had designers in from the get go. So, um, Icon, when we came in, um, to start working on a uh, concept for project Olympus, uh, we didn't want to build the technology like the printer in a vacuum. Uh, we would rather have it in kind of more of a, a closed creative loop um, for lack of a more graceful term. So um, we wanted the printer to be able to be, have the capabilities to produce the architecture that humans would actually need to live on the moon. Um, so you can do a chicken and egg scenario with it, or you can take some guesses. Or what we did is we brought in um, Search, uh, which is, uh, was one of the winners of, uh, that's one of the that's a Mars Ice House by Search that's on the screen right now. Um, so search was one of the winners of, uh, Mars centennial challenge, um, for 3d printed habitats, um, and their ice house. And then they had a, a later one called the X house, um, that both won awards in that competition. Um, icon actually entered that competition with the Colorado school of mines, uh, and ended up placing as one of the finalists, uh, in it, um, mostly on uh, a lot of the student work, um, which one of the students is now working at icon. Um, so uh yeah uh it just depends on uh that structure so we brought in the architects early um both big and search um did entire lunar complexes and design so we could look at the entire archetypes of all the types of structures that we could potentially need to make um from pressurized halves to unpressurized structures so like equipment garages and loading loading docks that kind of thing uh protective berms launch pads uh landing pads um roadways um just foundational things like slabs. So you can mount a solar array on top of it, you know, or other mm -hmm. equipment. So I um, looked at the entire thing. So it was a, from the very get go, um, the robotics design on Olympus, uh, the technology development to actually make the building materials and the building science, it was working in lockstep with the architects who were coming in and looking and say, okay, if we're serious about building on the moon, what does that look like? And the designs that Big um, in particular came up with for the habitat, they look nothing like the space station um, because they're actually intended to, to have a human in the loop. Like, uh, consider the human that's actually living in this space. And it ends up being something that's very graceful. Um, and the design was informed. I, it's, it can be completely 3D printed. Um, and 3D printed from moon dust, we scoop up off the ground. Um, so Olympus was kind of sized to be able to produce that type of architecture. Um, but the, the crazy engineering trick that Olympus does or has to do, um, or will do, I guess. Uh, yeah, there's the exterior of the big habitat. Um, 
is we have to print planar surfaces, so roadways and landing pads, but it also has to print volumetric structures, which is like this big hub. And Big did a lot of work um, that optimized their design. So um, the crazy kind of faceted face are actually 3D printed rib structures that overlap. So kind of like flying buttresses on a cathedral. Um, so that gives us really fast print times. And then uh, you take Olympus actually dumps um, unprocessed moon dust, just raw moon dust, into these kind of pockets on the ribs. Um, and that builds up radiation shielding. Um, mm. So that gives us a lot more thermal mass and radiation shielding and micrometeorite protection. Um, because the moon's pretty, pretty cratered up. It gets hit all the time. So uh, it still gets hit a lot. Um, not as much as the great bombardment that made them a lot of the craters we look at on the moon, the big ones. Um, yeah. But it gets, it gets hammered. Um, so uh, that was something in particular with the, um, the HABs that we had to look at. Um, and Big did a lot of other very, very clever and smart things in it with water storage, with water stored above um, the crew, the crew beds, sleeping quarters. Um, that's where all the water storage is, um, just to give you another layer of radiation protection, because uh, on average, that's where you're going to have the most amount of your time in anyone's space inside of a structure um, is when you're sleeping. Um, so it's like some lots of like, I mean, there's just a ton of it in there. Uh, very, very clever ideas uh, and concepts that were that were in that, but they were all practical and buildable. Um, and then we were doing the the robotics has been, uh, you can see on Olympus way off on the background on, on that bottom big one. Um, but uh, Olympus is kind of sized and designed to be able to print these halves um, that Big had come up with and those landing pads that Search had come up with and then uh, the roadways and everything else. Uh, so it's supposed to be a, an all-in-one construction system, which is kind of crazy. Um, but what's really fascinating, people are like, well, how does that reconcile all this crazy moon work? How, what is this? Why even bother when you're trying to solve, you know, the global housing crisis here on Earth um, and, you know, fix housing? Um, and for me, it's all about the ISRU. Um, so the technology that we actually have working, at least at, in lab scale right now, um, means that if we did, if we bring ISRU back to earth, um, if we could go to sub-Saharan Africa, pick up worthless dirt that's on the ground there and print a home with it. Um, anywhere in the US, it was like, wherever your printer is, you can pick up whatever you're standing, wherever the printer's standing on and potentially print with it. Um, and that's just a whole different paradigm change. Um, so if you have that coupled with 3D printing and you're applying that at scale on earth, and then that's, that's pretty disruptive, um, way more so than just either one of those technologies on their own. Um, so of course there's military applications. Cause I mean, why wouldn't the military want to kick a printer out the back of a plane and be able to print, you know, <laughs> barricades and defensive, defensive structures or whatever, um, wherever they're going. Um, so it, there's lots of applications to it, um, but the housing applications for it to me are, are really exciting um, because a lot of the, the things I ran into with Reaction um, mm -hmm. and a lot of the, some of the logistical things that Reaction actually solved, but um, another way to deal with it is not even have to bother with it. So if your only logistics are getting a robot to an area and then the robot can just make things in the area once it gets here, then that's it. Now I've got a tool that where we can actually let's now let's talk about seriously taking global housing crisis, just housing in general off the board for humanity uh, is not a worry or concern anymore. It's like these are the kind of technologies that enable that. And there is no one that would fund anybody to figure out how to do that here on Earth. Um, it takes going to the moon and going to some crazy extreme environment, dealing with a really crazy problem that have some kind of technological breakthroughs where you're just like, oh, well, what if I bring this back home? <laughs> and I was like, well, there's a lots of applications for it. Um, but this makes it a, a fantastic lab um, to try those out. Um, and we're really encouraged, like it's not impossible. We're not talking quantum computing here. This is, it's, it's very hard, but it's, it's doable, it's achievable and achievable fast. Um, we've covered a lot of ground in just one year. So it's, it's exciting. So when do we hope to see houses on the moon? In the 2030s. Sounds pretty good. It's coming fast. Well, the, the sci-fi movie, the moon bases that you think about in sci-fi. That's when you'll start seeing things that go on scale, I think. Yeah, this but makes I'm an me optimist think, too, so. 
<laughs> Sign me this up. makes me think of those old um, pirating video commercials. Like, like, oh, you wouldn't download a house. Well, maybe now we can. <laughs> you can, actually. Icon is working on that right now. You can download a house right now. <laughs> <laughs> I have Absolute game changer. Not the public. We can. And, and Icon, but everyone will be able to soon. <laughs> Um, well, I think we've taken up. We didn't up. even talk about Hyperloop. <laughs> I know. There's, there's a lot that we can go into here for sure. We haven't talked about like space travel, really. We've, we've had a lot to talk about. Um, yeah. Maybe this means we, we need to have you on again. Yeah, it's been an hour. I think yeah. I think we can say that till part two. Yeah. Yeah. If, if anybody watches this, then. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do another. It'll have three views. <laughs> I'll rewatch it myself. So we'll get at least one view. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. But on the docket for next time, definitely we got to talk about the electric motorcycle for sure. Just yep. space. Oh, yeah. The so many things in space in general right now. Um, but yeah, th I, this was a fantastic oh, yeah. conversation. I feel like we covered a ton of ground. Yeah. Well, I'm it's always happy stuff. to get nerdy anytime. So, <laughs> And SN, SN9 uh, is going to fly tomorrow, it looks like. so. Hopefully. Yeah, hopefully I've been keeping yeah, tabs be on that and – I really hope so. <laughs> yeah, I also want to yeah, talk got about the static fire too off today. So I want mm -hmm. to talk about Rocket Lab with you too, since that's a whole three D printing situation. But we'll we'll have to wait. Oh yeah, no Rocket Lab's fascinating. <laughs> I think. Um, yeah, I think they're my favorite small launch uh, provider though. That's my. I worry about all the small launch providers. Like I want them to all survive, but yeah, and there's, just, and, there's only so yeah. much market you can do. Yeah. And the big market now is going to be human human rated vehicles. So yeah, mm -hmm. and massive payloads. And massive payloads. Yeah. Yeah. Blue Origin and SpaceX, not the, not the fireflies, but. Yeah. Suborbital Blue Origin. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Or Virgin. It's like, God, how long does it take y'all to get to orbit, man? 20 years. <laughs> 20 years and counting. <laughs> One of these days. All right, guys. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, yeah. Really thank you so much. Yeah. Hope, hope you awesome. enjoyed it. It was fun. Yeah, no, it's fun. I'm happy to ramble and nerd out about any topic anytime. So. Awesome. <laughs>